tsunamis that obliterate our best defense systems. The scale of destruction was almost absolute. Volcanoes that kill millions. You don't want to get caught in one of these flows because you're simultaneously burnt, suffocated and pummeled to death. Earthquakes that expose the planet's inner secrets and diseases that push humanity towards extinction. The travel doctor took one look and said, you have the bubonic plague. But which catastrophes have had the biggest impact? We're going to reveal the top 10 ultimate natural disasters that have changed the world. Natural disaster. The moment a force of nature collides with humanity with tragic results. Now, together with some of the world's leading experts, we put together a list of the 10 most devastating disasters ever. Two, one. Disasters are rated by their magnitude their lasting legacy, death toll, and the economic cost of the damage they caused. First on our list is the deadly 2011 tornado season that meteorologist Karen Kosiba firmly places in the top 10. Spring in middle America. A tornado on the ground, ash toll A time when a vast swathe of land from Texas to the Canadian prairies is transformed into Tornado Alley. Don't even talk to Go. Get the hell here. This part of the world is used to twisters, but the 2011 outbreak stands out. Holy cow! We can actually hear the house coming apart. The wood, the walls. My wife had to grab a hold of some of the plumbing pipes because she was being sucked towards the stairwell. Look at that! Destruction! I've been collecting data in tornadoes for over seven years now, and I haven't seen anything like the 2011 tornado season. Weather experts like Karen are only just beginning to piece together how a tornado forms. We do know the ingredients that are necessary to come together in order to form the storms that spawn tornadoes. In particular, there are three ingredients that we need. First of all, we need a very unstable air mass. Also, we need wind shear, so we need a lot of turning of wind with height in the atmosphere. And then thirdly, we need some sort of trigger, some sort of impetus to get these storms started. In 2011, all three factors come together to create the perfect tornado breeding ground. By early April, a massive weather system forms over southeastern USA, spawning an outbreak of twisters. Only a small percentage of them were violent, but there were a lot of them. Unfortunately, in 2011, the violent tornadoes were impacting larger cities, and that's where we ran into our, our issues with people being unfortunately killed and injured. April the 25th, the start of a series of storms that'll generate 343 tornadoes in less than a week, killing 321 people. It's one of the deadliest outbreaks in US history jumbo outbreak of tornadoes, which is probably the worst kind to get. On April the 27th, a ferocious tornado batters Tuscaloosa, Alabama. 
This is a large, violent tornado coming up on downtown Tuscaloosa. Be in a safe place right now. Wind speeds approaching 300 kilometers per hour leave 65 people dead. The destruction was, in some cases, total and complete. After the horrific events of April 2011, the start of May is eerily quiet. Until May the 22nd, a massive tornado takes shape. In its path is Joplin, Missouri. My daughter came rushing out of her bedroom and said, you know, my friend's mom called. She said, there's a tornado coming. We need to get her home. Joplin resident Tim Bartu grew up in Tornado Alley. But even he's caught out by the storm's ferocity. Within a matter of a couple minutes, sirens actually started to go off. Cover on the ground right here. All right, get the sirens going. Get the sirens going. I'm telling you. The tornado carves a path through Joplin's southwestern suburbs. With just seconds to spare, Tim Bartow and his family find cover. As I was going around the corner to go down the basement, the corner of the kitchen was coming apart. hear the sound coming it was like these you know, people say it was like a, it sounds like a locomotive and it sounds like a dozen there was debris and chunks of mud and sludge and rain and glass and rocks and bricks and everything blowing in through that door and all around us and it was at that time that i realized the tornado was right on top of us we could actually hear the house coming apart. And I thought there's nothing between us and the vortex of this tornado except one inch piece of wood that we have in the floor. And of course, the rest of the family, they were crying and they were just, just hysterical. Intense updrafts near the surface, wafting all different sorts of debris, lifting houses and cars, creating a very dangerous, dark, and volatile environment. Tornadoes really are one of the most devastating forces in nature on the planet. The carnage caused by a direct hit from an EF-5 tornado is all too real for the residents of Joplin, Missouri. Joplin's just been leveled. Houses are gone, people are, people are thrown, injured. I know we're gonna cancel these. It is like a damn floor. It's, it's gone, it's Joplin. gone. And at that point, I didn't know how bad it was, but I knew we had survived the direct hit. Unbelievable, look at the houses. That's when I got my first look at what had happened. With winds in excess of 320 kilometers per hour, the energy released is equivalent to that of a 10-ton bomb detonating. Hello? Hello? Oh, give her, sweetie. Give her, honey. The house now was gone. The kitchen was totally gone. And there were parts of other people's houses in our kitchen. And one by one, you'd see these piles of rubbles where an arm would poke through or leg would poke through. Most of the family <clears throat> broke down and started to cry. Leaving 158 people dead, the Joplin tornado is the deadliest since modern records began. And with over $2.8 billion worth of damage, it's also the costliest. The 758 twisters in April are the greatest number ever seen in one month. It's for these reasons Karen Kasiba rates the 2011 tornado season as one of the top 10 natural disasters. Not only do we have a lot of tornadoes, especially in the months of April and May, but we also had tornadoes hitting populated areas. And not just any type of tornado, so the highest possible wind speeds that could be associated with tornadoes. Those factors in particular are what made that season so devastating.
March 2011, a massive earthquake rocks the world on its axis. The epicenter, 65 kilometers off the coast of Japan. In Japan, we get earth tremors every few weeks. There's amazing earthquake technology. Within minutes of the quake, a huge tsunami is detected racing towards Japan's northern shoreline. What follows will leave the world reeling. Absolute destruction, not a building left standing. The 2011 Japanese quake and tsunami is the costliest natural disaster of all time and the reason why coastal engineer Alison Raby puts it in the top 10. Japan has a long history of being hit by big waves. In fact, the word tsunami is Japanese for harbour wave. And it's this history that has led to Japan having the most sophisticated protection systems on the planet. Japan sits at the junction of four major tectonic plates. It's why the area is so geologically volatile and why the Japanese are so well prepared to deal with the threat. So what went wrong in 2011? The problems begin on March the 11th. Earthquake detection systems predict a huge tremor with a magnitude of 7.2. Warnings are sent out. Chris Alderson has lived in Japan for 13 years. He's come to expect such tremors as an everyday part of life. Earthquakes are sufficiently common that people don't usually concern themselves with them overly. Some of them are so minor they barely even uh, stir comment. Others, people will perk up their ears a little bit, point out the earthquake to their co-workers and get back to their work. At 2.46 p.m. local time, the earthquake hits. With a magnitude of nine, it's a hundred times more powerful than predicted. You tend to expect them to fade away as usual. Instead, they sort of grew in strength and intensity to an extent that none of us had experienced before. It's the largest known quake in Japanese history. One of the five most powerful ever recorded. The quake's epicenter is 65 kilometers off Japan's east coast, where a 300-kilometer section of the Earth's crust is pushed upwards by about five meters. It's a seismic event known as an undersea megathrust earthquake. The force of the shockwaves is so enormous, Japan moves two and a half meters, and the axis of the entire planet shifts about 18 centimeters. Despite the magnitude of the quake, precautionary measures limit the damage. There's a great deal of education among the Japanese population about how to behave during such disasters. So whilst there was concern, there wasn't the sort of terrified panic which one might suspect. It appears technology has protected the Japanese. But the earthquake is just the first phase of a double disaster they had to face that day because the tremor has given birth to a tsunami and it's heading towards Japan's northern coastline. Coastal engineer Alison Raby has been studying why the events of 2011 escalated into one of the worst disasters of its kind, placing it in the top 10. We're going to simulate that mega thrust type events using this hinged board down here. That's going to represent the edge of the crust that comes up in that type of rupture. And we're going to spring that plate up, and that's going to raise a huge body of water. Three, two, one. In open water, the initial wave is relatively small, just a meter high. But as it approaches the shoreline and enters the shallows, it begins to slow and grow in height.
all too aware earthquakes can cause huge waves, Japan has a sophisticated tsunami warning system. In Japan, when there is a tsunami, warnings are automatically generated, which are heard on cell phones, brought onto television stations. Immediately, people were aware that something was going on. Along Japan's northeast coastline, people begin to evacuate or take refuge in designated shelters. Japan had one of the best defended coastlines in the whole world. And here we recreated certain parts of the Japanese coastline. Raby and her team have reconstructed particular towns and their defenses to examine how they coped when the tsunami hit. We start here in the city of Kamaishi. Kamaishi was a deep water port and it had the world's deepest breakwater. This was protecting the very large steel factory and a large population. Further south, we had the settlement of Minami Sanriku. And here we've recreated one of the vertical evacuation structures. This was clearly signed so that people who were on low ground could escape from the incoming wave. And then we move into the coastal plains. Now these were protected by concrete revetments and behind that a pine forest. And those were all designed to protect the settlements behind. The Japanese have taken a calculated risk. Their fortifications are only designed to cope with waves up to 12 meters high. But the tsunami surging towards them is a monster, peaking at 40 meters. Tokyo, Chris Alderson is stunned by what he sees. As we watched images on the screen of hundreds of thousands of people losing their homes and being hauled from their day-to-day -day humdrum lives, <laughs> it was something none of us could comprehend at first. Alison Raby recreates the tsunami in miniature. By comparing footage from each of the towns hit by the tsunami to the model recreations, a demo can help understand why the best defenses on the planet failed so catastrophically. Not only did the trees do little to stop the wave, the shattered stumps added to the debris flow, making the tsunami even more lethal. The shelter in Minami Sanriku remained intact, but many similar shelters were too close to the shore, with over a hundred ending up underwater. And after the tsunami passed, the state-of-the-art Kamaishi breakwater wall lay in pieces. To help the victims, Chris Alderson heads north to the flood zone. We went from the humdrum day-to-day life in the big city to suddenly traveling through what appeared like a set from a science fiction post-Holocaust movie. To suddenly see these people torn from their homes, to see the scale of this destruction and death where a boat is dropped in the middle of a village or a large articulated truck is stranded on the roof of a factory, it was Unworldly. It was very difficult to believe that this was a new reality. The disaster gets even worse when a flooded reactor at the Fukushima Daiichi plant melts down. Initially, reports were unreliable. We were not certain to what extent um, the radiation had spread and whether or not the situation was about to get worse or was going to come under control. Thanks to the courage of the reactor workers, the situation is brought under control. The tsunami leaves over $200 billion worth of damage in its wake, making it the costliest natural disaster ever. The scale of destruction was almost absolute. 
There were no people in the ruins that we could see other than military workers putting flags on human remains, uh, marking cars with X's after they checked them to see if bodies were included. The smell of the decomposition of what had been washed out of the oceans, human remains, fish hung heavy in the air, and it was an experience I think nothing can prepare you for. For Alison Raby, it's not just the cost, but also the way the tsunami exposed the frailty of our most sophisticated protection systems that elevates this disaster into the top 10. Japan was supposedly the best prepared nation on earth to survive a mega tsunami, and yet even they underestimated the power of the wave. And for that reason, I believe that this event is one of the world's worst natural disasters. Nineteen eighteen. A viral disease known as the Spanish flu is spreading around the globe like wildfire. Decimating every country it touches, the virus kills an estimated 30 million people in less than six months. And a hundred years on, its deadly descendants are now one of the biggest threats we face. The CDC is working to develop a vaccine. We are closely monitoring the emerging cases of swine flu in the United States. The speed with which the Spanish flu killed millions is why virologist Dr. Mike Leahy nominates it as one of the top 10 natural disasters. By 1918, the First World War was drawing to an end. For the last four years, the world had been locked in conflict centered on the battlefields of Europe, with around nine million soldiers losing their lives. But the fighters of the front line were back, with some dying within the first 24 hours. Even battle-hardened medics were horrified by the gruesome way the men died. The lungs of many victims were so full of fluid they were compared by pathologists to the lungs of the drowned. It was the start of a pandemic that would affect almost every country in the world and leave tens of millions dead. In the warring countries, news about the outbreak was limited. But the disease was heavily reported in neutral Spain, earning it the name Spanish flu. Leahy believes the conditions in the trenches could provide clues to the source of the outbreak. The emergence of new viral diseases can often be triggered by close associations between large numbers of people and animals, such as pigs. When humans become infected with an animal flu virus, an entirely new strain of influenza can be created. Hence the name of outbreaks such as swine flu or bird flu. So it's not difficult to imagine that during the First World War, when large numbers of soldiers were barracked right next door to animals, often in the presence of gases that could possibly be mutagenic, a new virus could surface. With the men crammed together, the disease tears through the ranks. In the US Army, as many as one million men contract the virus. But the epidemic in the trenches is only the beginning. On the 11th of November, 1918, peace is declared. Returning troops unwittingly spread the disease across the globe, escalating it into a pandemic. Mass celebrations accelerate the transmission and up to one billion people, half the world's population at the time, become infected. One of the most frightening aspects of the 1918 epidemic was the way it struck people down in their prime. The death rate among 15 to 34 year olds was around 20 times higher than that of other flus. Why was Spanish flu so deadly to those who should have been the fittest? Breakthroughs in understanding how the virus attacks our body may provide the answer. 
The key thing about Spanish flu and other severe pandemics is that the immune system attacks the lining of the lung and that causes liquids and fluids to start to seep in. People effectively start to drown in their own fluids. It must have been horrific to experience and actually horrific to observe as well. Um, there's lots of descriptions in the medical literature at the time of these patients slowly turning blue. And when nurses and doctors saw that, they knew it was their end. And this wasn't something that was unique to weaker or old people, quite the opposite. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, they were young and healthy, probably contributed to it because what caused the damage to the lungs is part of the immune system. And it's called a cytokine cascade. So your immune system started to damage the lungs, and that's what allowed the liquids and the fluids to get in there and for people to actually drown. The viral descendants of Spanish flu are still claiming lives in the 21st century. 2009, the H1N1 swine flu kills up to 500,000 people, causing the World Health Organization to raise the pandemic alert to the highest level. Swine flu is just one of many diseases that can trace their origins back to the World War I outbreak. Other diseases may have killed more people, but none so swiftly. In 12 months, Spanish flu claimed the lives of between 20 and 100 million people. Potentially, that's 10 times the number of soldiers who died during the four years of World War I. In the US, the epidemic reduced average lifespan by 10 years. And it's these horrific statistics that place Spanish flu firmly in our list of natural disasters. In the summer of 1883, the Indonesian volcano Krakatoa is becoming increasingly restless. It'll soon blow itself out of the water in a horrific spectacle that will guarantee its iconic status. Professor Nick Petford votes this first globally reported disaster into the top 10 because of the dramatic way it led to the birth of volcanology. Bedford travels to where the legendary Krakatoa once stood. Anak Krakatoa is one of the most volcanically active places on the planet. Here, one vast tectonic plate is being pushed below another, allowing super-hot lava to surge to the surface. Since the 1950s, the volcano has grown in height by an average of four meters a year. Anak Krakatoa is a classic cone-shaped volcano with one peak. But in 1883, the Krakatoa volcano comprised three separate peaks. And what people thought was that meant it was three small volcanoes. Well, that was a big mistake, because underlying those volcanoes was one single magma chamber. And when it blew, the amount of energy that was released in the eruption was enough to blow the entire island apart. At the time, there were hundreds of Europeans living in the area, trading the spices that flourished on the fertile volcanic soils. But there was one Dutch expat in particular, a man called Roger Verbeek, a geologist. Verbeek spent the summer before the eruption of 1883 surveying the islands. Verbeek's report would play a crucial role in establishing Krakatoa's lasting legacy. Sunday, August the 26th, 1883. The morning calm is shattered by one massive explosion after another. Clues to what the 1883 eruption would have been like can be seen on Anak Krakatau, which is littered with huge lava bombs. 
Now, this is a big piece. It's about the size of a car. And around me here, there are two or three similar-sized bombs. But in 1883, when Krakatoa was in full eruption, the sky would have been full of hundreds of these sorts of bombs flying not just hundreds of yards, but perhaps tens of miles, literally a rain of fire falling from above. By 2 p.m., a black cloud three times the height of Mount Everest surges up from the volcano. In the immediate aftermath of the 1883 eruption, we know from eyewitness reports that the skies darkened. Day turned into night. And that was because so much ash and dust was thrown up into the atmosphere. But the effects were felt farther away than just Indonesia. People talk of strange sunsets with vivid colours uh, in London, in Paris, in New York. And all of those things were due to the volcanic eruption in 1883. 27th of August, 5 a.m. Four monstrous eruptions rip through the volcano. The force of the blast is 13,000 times that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The sound generated is the loudest in recorded history. The explosive eruptions throw out billions of tons of pulverized rock, scalding hot ash, and gas that accelerate down and away from the volcano. It's been calculated these pyroclastic flows have enough power to climb over 830 meters, twice as tall as the Empire State Building. They might expect a pyroclastic flow when it hits the sea to stop because of the water, but that's not the case. Sometimes a pyroclastic flow, if it's strong enough and hot enough, it can hit the sea and keep on traveling. Steam forms around the front of the flow and protects it from the water. We know this was the case in the 1883 eruption because on that morning, villagers in a town called Ketimbang gathered to watch the spectacle. Within minutes, the super fast, super hot debris crosses the 40 kilometers of water towards the residents of Ketimbang. Probably the last thing that they ever saw was a pyroclastic flow emerging from the waves. And you don't want to get caught in one of these flows because you're simultaneously burnt, suffocated, and pummeled to death by the rock. Around a 1,000 of Ketimbang's residents die instantly. And the disaster isn't finished yet. During Krakatoa's final death throes, the volcano collapses into the ocean. The splash triggers a tsunami of epic proportions, traveling at 320 kilometers per hour. In its path is the small Javanese settlement of Anya. On the west coast of Java, a Dutch lighthouse, very similar to the one that stands here today, towers above the surrounding buildings. It's constructed to cope with the worst that the weather can throw at it. Even though the tsunami is heading their way, the keeper and his family choose to stay to ensure the lighthouse remains operational. So when a building like this is made from reinforced steel, they must have felt safe, even from the most powerful of waves. But adding to the power of the wave are huge chunks of rock torn from the seabed. When the wave struck, it was 40 meters high. That's about 130 feet, nearly as high as I am here now. The wave ripped up from the sea floor, great big lumps of coral, and slammed them against the side of the lighthouse. And despite being reinforced with an iron girder, the lighthouse collapsed. These bricks are all that remain of the ill-fated lighthouse. Miraculously, the lighthouse keeper survived, but his wife and child perished in the water along with tens of thousands of others. It's the most destructive tsunami created by a volcano in history. As the sun sets on the 27th of August, 1883, Krakatoa is no more. The volcano has blown itself out of existence.
As well as being a spectacular volcanic eruption, Krakatoa is important for other reasons. Just before the eruption, undersea telegraph cables had been laid between Jakarta and the rest of the world. So as the eruption unfolded, people could follow it in real time, you know, the same way that we would do today using the internet. So in that sense, Krakatoa became the world's first globally reported disaster story. The Dutch geologist Roger Verbeek also played a critical role in raising Krakatoa to its iconic status. But after the eruption, his report was so insightful that it laid the foundations for an entire new science, volcanology. And it's for these reasons that Krakatoa was one of the top 10 natural disasters of all time. August the 24th, 2005, a tropical storm forms over the Bahamas. Five days later, it will leave the city of New Orleans in ruins. Everything was gone within a flickering of an eye. A chain of natural events and human error will conspire to make Katrina the world's most expensive hurricane. It's just all just going. It's for these reasons meteorologist Tim Marshall thinks this disaster should be in the top 10. New Orleans is a city surrounded by water. 300 years ago, it was just a small settlement on the bank of the Mississippi River, high above sea level. But over time, it's expanded out into marshlands, and people now live below sea level in much of New Orleans. With large sections of the city below the waterline, people here are particularly vulnerable to hurricanes because it's not just the high winds that make these weather systems so dangerous, but the body of water that's pushed before them, known as a storm surge. Many hurricane deaths are the result of drowning. On the 24th of August, 2005, the National Hurricane Center is tracking the tropical storm that will become Katrina. Katrina first formed, uh, it was nothing really unusual. It was pretty much like any other tropical system at that point. The storm soon intensifies to a Category 1 hurricane. So our demeanor at that point was to treat it like a normal hurricane that we've seen many times before. Like all hurricanes, Katrina forms as rising warm air from the sea creates strong winds and thick clouds full of moisture. Fueled by the unusually warm seas of the Gulf of Mexico, Katrina quickly grows into a much bigger and more powerful hurricane. Back at the weather center, Katrina looms large on the screens. The satellite imagery revealed a huge eye. It became apparent that we were dealing with a Category 5 hurricane at this point. The data shows Katrina will strike New Orleans in less than 24 hours. We had to start issuing our watches and warnings and statements. Every person is hereby ordered to immediately evacuate. Those that can get out of town. One million people flee the city. But many people simply can't afford to leave. Stanley and Betty Stewart live in the Lower Ninth Ward. The decision was made that we weren't going to be able to go anywhere under the financial conditions. And uh, we elect to just stay and pray and hope for the best. So it ended up being 13 of us in the two rooms, basically. All of us know we hunker down. Up to 100,000 people are left behind to face whatever nature has to throw at them. We padded our back door with some towels to just keep the water from actually seeping on them. With a long history of hurricane strikes, New Orleans is surrounded by 560 kilometers of protective levees. 
A levee is just made of combinations of clay and sand. The big problem came with all of these miles of levee, that some levees were high and some levees were low, some were sinking. Worse still, the levees were not built to withstand a hurricane of Katrina's intensity. The 29th of August, 6.10 a.m. Hurricane Katrina strikes land with wind speeds of 210 kilometers per hour. With waves up to eight meters high, the largest storm surge in American history pummels the Gulf Coast. New Orleans is inundated with water. You can actually hear the waves coming over the roof of the home. Those stranded have little idea what to do. My brother, you know, looked at me. I said, man, we just really need to pray, I said, because visually it actually looked like it was going to be your last day on Earth. 2 p.m., and the residents of the Lower Ninth Ward are in serious trouble. We got major flooding here. Uh, lots of problems here, lots of problems. Some people were actually, by that time, in 20 feet of water. Some of our friends that were in homes they, they had loss of life. The 30th of August, the hurricane has blown itself out. All the main communication lines are down. You're just trying to figure out, are we the only people left, or is there anybody else around? Most of New Orleans underwater, the emergency services are left floundering. They finally said on the radio, you've got to realize that the levee on the 17th Street Canal broke and there's water to the roofs of the houses in Lakeview. I can tell you my life changed right at that point. Everybody didn't realize that this was a new ball game now, that now the city was flooding. Chris and his colleagues face a disaster of epic proportions. Everywhere you went, you saw bodies floating. They didn't have enough coroners to come pick up the bodies. The survivors are corralled into the New Orleans Superdome and Convention Center. The conditions that, that was at the convention center was unbearable. People were thinking that they were going to go to a lit shelter where maybe there would have been food or clothing or water. It was nothing. And people were literally just abandoned out on the streets. With over 46,000 people, some are left with little option but to fend for themselves. People were dying for lack of resources. We were like, oh my goodness, is this the end of the earth? Is this the end of life? The failure by the authorities to deal with the rescue and evacuation of so many compounds the disaster. The big thing that caught people off guard was the flood waters. Um, uh, nobody expected 80% of the city to be underwater. Almost a decade later, one in five of the population still hasn't returned. And large sections of the city lie in ruins. Well, I'm currently driving through the Lower Ninth Ward here, one of the areas that was hardest hit from Hurricane Katrina. And most of the houses here, people didn't come back to. They just abandoned them or just left them here to rot. It's sort of sad because a neighborhood is gone. It's going to take a generation or more to rebuild this area. Two weeks after Katrina swamped New Orleans, President George Bush apologizes for the administration's failure to deal with the aftermath. Katrina exposed serious problems in our response capability at all levels of government. 
And to the extent that the federal government uh, didn't fully do its job right, I take responsibility. The impact of human error is why Tim Marshall places this disaster in the top 10. Certainly, Hurricane Katrina was a natural disaster, but that natural disaster was compounded by the effects of man. The fact that Katrina happened was a wake-up call. Now, the levees are built a little higher, maybe a little stronger. But this disaster can happen. In fact, it will happen again. This is how the Earth looked at the end of the last ice age. The northern hemisphere covered in ice. Europe barely recognizable. But evidence suggests the world map is about to be redrawn by a mega flood of biblical proportions. Oceanographer Simon Boxall is fascinated by the idea of a planet-changing flood and has nominated it for the top 10. This disaster begins around 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. A huge glacier covering an area we now know as Canada is receding. As it melts, a vast freshwater lake bigger than Texas forms. For a time, the water is contained behind a wall of ice. But eight and a half thousand years ago, this ice gives way, releasing this colossal body of water into the world's oceans. This had a dramatic impact on the already rising sea levels, adding a further one to two meters, that's three to six feet in a very short period of time. And if that was to happen today with the same speed, it would completely devastate London, New York. In fact, it would impact on every coastal nation around the world. And in the ancient world, the rising waters spreading across the planet could have also led to disaster. Because according to some studies, the area now covered by the Black Sea was once home to one of the largest populations of the time. 9,000 years ago, this would have been an enormous valley leading down to this huge freshwater lake. It would have been filled with settlements, farmlands, a population of over 100,000 people. But that all changed when the floodwaters hit. Swollen by the mega flood, water from the Mediterranean begins to pour into the region, transforming the once fertile land into a saltwater sea. Simon Boxall meets Konstantin Cherev, who in 2011 took part in a survey of the Black Sea that produced an astonishing find. When we uh, scanned the seabed, uh, we found a formation that's uh, really unusual. It was sort of a round hill, and that's not very common for the Black Sea. So we decided to send a probe and take a sample of it. As they carefully inspected the core sample, the scientists made an unexpected discovery. Tiny pieces of wood. This is the top. When we analyzed the wood and carbon dated it, we found that it's 9,000 years old, and that's amazing. Where do you think it came from? The most exciting scenario is that uh, this underwater hill is actually uh, an ancient tale human settlement because as a shape and size and height, uh, it exactly matches the settlements on the ground we found all over Eastern Europe. Cherev is certain an area that's now under 90 meters of water was once dry land. Absolutely, I'm 100% positive about it. To find out more about the people that were living in the region hit by the flood, Simon Boxall has been given rare access to examine an incredible archaeological find. Yeah. 
unearthed from a nearby burial site dating back over 6,000 years were over 200 skeletons, along with a spectacular treasure trove of gold. Expert Christo Smolinov believes this precisely made jewelry is proof of a surprisingly advanced civilization. For instance, those are two separate gold objects, quite different, and still they fit perfectly. And this is more than you can expect from a culture 7,000 years old. It is a superculture. It's amazing how precise their measurements were in a culture that is so ancient. Christo has little doubt this superculture was living right in the mega flood's path. And he believes the exodus of these people played a crucial role in the development of Western civilization. I think the migration of this superculture that followed some of the catastrophic events that took place here is responsible for the migration of knowledge as well. If Smolanov is correct, it is possible that the scattering of this ancient population may have sowed the seeds from which the Egyptian and Greek cultures eventually grew 2,000 years later. Simon Boxall is also convinced of the profound effect this mega flood had on humanity. This flood drove apart a burgeoning civilization, possibly one of the earliest we know. And yet, this flood could have been the catalyst that led to our modern civilization. And it's for this reason that I believe that this ancient flood deserves its place amongst the world's top 10 natural disasters. In 1906, San Francisco is the biggest and most powerful city on America's west coast. But what none of its inhabitants know is they're living over a ticking time bomb. That's all about to change when a massive quake strikes. Seismologist Thomas Jordan has selected this earth-shattering event for the top 10 because of the way it helped unlock the inner secrets of our planet and revolutionized our understanding of how we can protect ourselves from these deadly forces. Modern day San Francisco. Its famous switchback streets provide clues to just how geologically active the area is. The hills here in San Francisco and around the San Francisco Bay remind us that the forces that caused them are the same as those that caused the 1906 earthquake. At the time, of course, people didn't understand that this beautiful topography was related to earthquakes. That would become very evident on April 18th, 1906. On the night of April the 17th, the famed tenor Enrico Caruso performs at the San Francisco Opera House. But in just a few hours, this proud city will be turned into a disaster zone. At five in the morning, things were pretty quiet. But suddenly at 5.12, the earthquake hit. An earthquake with a magnitude of 7.8 shakes the city. Roads rip apart and people panic. People realized it was an earthquake, but very few understood where the earthquake might be coming from and what might happen next. Buildings never designed to withstand earthquakes crumble. The city hall was the biggest building west of the Mississippi River. It took humans 25 years to build it. It took the earthquake two minutes to destroy it. It's not just the collapse of their homes the residents have to deal with. The tremors crack gas pipes. 
All it takes is one flame to ignite the fumes. In just a few hours, an inferno engulfs San Francisco. There were probably 50 fires that began in this part of San Francisco, and they eventually coalesced into a massive firestorm that consumed, on the first day, all of the central business district down along Market Street. Those flames then spread on the second and third day uh, to the west and north up to uh, Fisherman's Wharf. During those three days, uh, the city was almost completely destroyed by fire. After three days, the fires burned themselves out to leave a scene of utter annihilation. 80% of the city is in ruins. But it's what happens next that makes the 1906 earthquake one of the top 10 disasters. Three days after the 1906 earthquake, before the fires of San Francisco had stopped burning, George Pardee, the governor of California, appointed a special commission to study the earthquake and learn from what had happened. It falls to Professor Andrew Lawson and his team from Berkeley University to conduct the first comprehensive survey of an earthquake. The Lawson report in two volumes represents a most incredible breakthrough in our understanding of how earthquakes work. At the time, people thought the fault line that runs near San Francisco was caused by the quake. But Lawson's report confirmed it was the other way around and he named the culprit behind the 1906 disaster, the San Andreas Fault. It's a revelation that's helped geologists like Alan Lester to better understand the mechanics of earthquakes. The disastrous 1906 earthquake turned out to be a huge learning point for geologists regarding how big faults like the San Andreas move. Strike slip faults like the San Andreas have the capacity to build up huge amounts of strain and stress within the earth. It's, it, it's very much like taking a stick and pushing on it, building and building the deformation in the stick. And if that force, if that stress is released, it comes right back, it's elastic. But there is a point where if you push a little too hard, it breaks. That's exactly what happened in 1906 and with most of the major earthquakes that have occurred along the San Andreas, a point has been reached where the earth can no longer take the strain that's been building and it breaks. Thanks to the Lawson report, we can now identify high-risk earthquake zones and engineer buildings to protect the people living in them. For Thomas Jordan, this ability to better cope with the dangers from earthquakes can be traced back to the birth of modern seismology. From my personal point of view, the 1906 earthquake is the most important earthquake because we learn for the first time important facts about how earthquakes occur. And with that knowledge, we hope to be able to avoid the kinds of destruction that San Francisco saw in that terrible day. The 7th of June, 1783. For weeks, rumbling from deep inside the earth has disturbed the peace of the Icelandic countryside. Within 24 hours, it will be ripped apart and transformed into a fiery hell on earth. It's the start of a toxic cataclysm that will engulf the Northern Hemisphere, claiming countless victims from Europe to Asia. Although this disaster is relatively unknown, volcanologist Thor Thordeson rates it as the deadliest volcanic eruption ever, earning it its place in the top 10. Sitting directly on top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where two vast plates are pulling away from each other, Iceland is one of the most volcanic places on Earth. 
In 1783, the plates are particularly restless. As they lurch violently apart, a 30-kilometer crack in the Earth's surface, known as the Larky Fissure, rips open. Along its length, 130 bubbling craters spew out billions of tons of molten rock, and will continue to do so for eight fiery months. It is the largest eruption on Earth in the last 500 years that makes Larky one of the greatest eruptions in history. As Larky erupts, over 40 billion tons of lava spill out of the fissure, enough to engulf a city the size of Chicago. Normally, when lava is exposed to air, it cools and solidifies, which limits how far it can travel. But the lava from Larky was able to travel for hundreds of kilometers, thanks to an underground system. Led by local guide Bjorn Hjorsen, Thor explores the remnants of this subterranean network, known as lava tubes. The caves are created when the upper layers of lava form a crust, protecting the free-flowing molten rock below from the cold air. Look at that level of the lava river right there. And up here, part of the roof is remelting, and then you can even see these nice little droplets coming down. This shows how hot this environment was at the time, how hot the lava is, how hot the gas is right above the lava, because to form this, the temperature needs to be at 1100 degrees C. These are the key to making long lava flows. When you transport the lava through these kind of systems, it just stays fluid and hot all the way down until it breaks out of the transport system. Traveling through the tubes, Larky's lava spreads over 60 kilometers before eventually resurfacing. In total, the molten rock raises 20 villages to the ground. Larky also hurls out millions of tons of ash and toxic gases, poisoning the soil and crops. Three quarters of Iceland's sheep and more than half of all its livestock die. The people soon follow. Because of starvation and other diseases, about 21% of the Icelandic population perished as a consequence of the Larky eruption. But the Larky eruption is to have an even more disastrous effect on the rest of the world. Although remote, Icelandic volcanoes can have far-reaching consequences, as recent events prove. The cloud from Larky engulfs a vast part of the Northern Hemisphere and carries with it something far more deadly than just ash. A total of 120 million tonnes of sulfur dioxide were emitted into the atmosphere where it reacted with atmospheric vapour to produce sulfuric aerosols. These aerosols block the sun's heat, causing global temperatures to plummet. In Europe, the cold causes intolerable food shortages. Some experts believe these drove hungry peasants in France to rise up, eventually leading to the French Revolution of 1789. Across the Atlantic, temperatures also drop dramatically. On the east board of North America, the winter 1783-84 is the longest and the most severe on record. In my view, makes this one of the most important natural disasters of all times. Twenty sixth of December, two thousand and four. Tourists relax on the beaches around the Indian Ocean. In just three hours, the lives of hundreds of thousands of people will be wiped out. Get inside, get inside. By the deadliest tsunami ever seen. It's this disaster that tsunami expert Jose Barrero has selected for the top ten. A 
I'm here in Banda Aceh, Sumatra, the northern tip of Sumatra Island facing into the Indian Ocean. This place in particular suffered one of the worst tsunami disasters in human history. The Indian Ocean, bordered by Asia, Africa and Australia. In December 2004, millions are enjoying the holiday season along its shores, including Steve Gill, his wife Heather and stepdaughter Charlotte, who are on vacation in Thailand. We had arranged uh, to go out for a traditional Christmas meal. Everything was new and warm and fairly unspoiled, undeveloped, um, very, very quiet. Idyllic, I guess you'd say, yeah. In the Indonesian town of Banda Aceh, local resident Eddie Quenslow is visiting friends and family. I went to the town, sleep in my friend's house. There is uh, close between my sister's house and my friend's house. At about 8 a.m. local time on December 26, 2004, everything changed. Just offshore from here, where the Indo-Australian plate subducts underneath the Eurasian plate, more than a thousand years of tectonic stress were released in a matter of seconds. The earthquake has a magnitude of 9.1, the third largest ever recorded. As the Eurasian plate thrusts upwards by 20 meters, it displaces billions of tons of water. The resulting wave traveled east towards Thailand and Indonesia and west towards India and Sri Lanka. And in the tsunami's path were millions of people. Peaking at 800 kilometers an hour, the tsunami will take 30 minutes to hit the Sumatran coast. Around an hour later, it will reach Thailand. Although they felt the earthquake, with no tsunami warning systems in place, people around the Indian Ocean coastline are oblivious to the approaching threat. I saw the building is destroyed. And we are scared, of course, but we didn't know it tsunami it's happened. For the holiday makers in Thailand, the first hint of the impending disaster is the strange sight of the ocean disappearing. The bay was empty. All I could see was rocks all the way over to the Yacht Club, all the way over to the other island. There's nothing there. One of the more enduring and dramatic images of the 2004 tsunami was the withdrawal of the water level from the shoreline, leaving the entire foreshore area exposed. This is a phenomenon known as drawdown, and it's caused by the tectonic displacements offshore. While one section of the plate is thrust upwards, the section of the plate closer to the coastline actually subsides, and the water rushing in to fill that void is what causes the withdrawal of the shoreline. Had more people realized that this was the sign of an impending tsunami, perhaps more lives would have been saved. This is the time people should have started running. But instead, the curious sight lures people onto the beach. It was bizarre, but it was fascinating. I think I did actually briefly go to the front of the house again and, and, and look and think about, you know, walking out. And I thought, no, nah, that's just not right. It's just, it's wrong. Exactly how it's wrong, I don't know, but it's wrong. By the time many react, it's too late. Myself, my wife, and uh, my stepdaughter discussed our next move, and uh, and we just didn't get to make it, basically. At 8.15 a.m., the tsunami hits northern Sumatra. The city of Banda Aceh, home to over a quarter of a million people, is about to suffer its full force. I'm here in the busy city center of Banda Aceh, and it was here on this street corner where some of the most graphic video footage of the tsunami was recorded. On the street behind me, the tsunami surge came flowing up the road, channeled between the buildings. Watching the footage, we see that the leading edge of the tsunami was actually slow enough that people could escape simply by running or walking. However, this part of Banda Aceh is very far from the ocean, and people simply didn't know what to do. 
As the flood depth increases, so too does the speed of the flow until there's no way to escape unless you can get to high ground. That's what the person who shot this video did. He climbed up over here. And he lived. However, thousands of other people that day could not get to high ground and they ended up dying in the waves. Crammed with billions of tons of debris, the wave is an unstoppable battering ram. Eddie Quenslow is one of the many that scrambled to safety near the Grand Mosque. Materials come like the iron, the stone, the rocks, the bed, shirt, motorcycle, a car. You can see people uh, mixed with the water, everything material. The tsunami wave came right through here. These are very sturdy concrete buildings, and many of them weren't knocked over by the tsunami, but rather the water flowed through them, between them, and actually channelized the flow and made it speed up and get deeper in some areas. The water here didn't go past the, the first story. It was all pretty much less than about eight or 10 feet deep. So in terms of escaping, a lot of people could have gotten away just by getting up to the second story as the cameraman did at the corner. I was thinking I will die. And I saw many people need help, but I could not help because too many people need help. I saw many babies. Of course they need help. Sometimes I just take put on the top because I don't know where I have to bring them, how I can bring them to where, because all oh, is a flood. That means everywhere is water. 30 minutes after the tsunami hits Banda Aceh, it smashes into the Thai island of Phuket. Get inside, get inside. Steve Gill's beach bungalow is directly in its path. I, I think our conversation ended when we heard the roar of the water. We still couldn't see the wave until we turned to look at the small alleyway between the two buildings. It was traveling at a speed estimated between two and 300 miles an hour. And it was just, it was, the scene was obliterated by water. It was 30 foot high. And by that time, there was nothing we could do, nothing. I remember being struck by the water Realistically, there wasn't any expectation of ever coming out the other side. It was just, you know, is this the way it ends? Because this, the sheer power of what has hit you doesn't allow any space for an escape plan. There are no plans for the future. found in the stagnant uh, uh, wreckage, if you like, um, about a quarter of a mile up the road. Although he soon reunites with his stepdaughter, Steve is never to see his wife alive again. Over the next 20 minutes, three massive waves up to 10 meters high crash into the small resort. 1,000 tons of water smashing down on each meter of coastline. Beach after beach, wave after wave, the tsunami brings death and destruction. In Thailand, over 5,000 people perish, with another 3,000 missing. In Indonesia, the tsunami obliterates Banda Aceh. not amazing why like this I lose my best friend I was thinking like why God didn't take me better he take me than my best friend and uh, and also but my auntie also we didn't find his buddies my cousin 
many of my cousins passed away. We cannot find bodies. In total, the waves strike 14 countries around the Indian Ocean, taking lives as far away as Africa. The final death toll will make the 2004 tsunami the most lethal ever seen. A decade on, and the streets of Banda Aceh are as busy as ever. And lessons have been learnt. Buildings like this one have been constructed throughout the area to provide safe refuge should another killer wave strike. For Jose Barrero, they're a powerful reminder of why he regards this disaster as one of the worst ever. The combination of the exceptionally large earthquake and the tsunami which caused such a devastating human toll over so many countries makes the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami one of the top 10 natural disasters in human history. The year is 1348. All around the world, people fall victim to a strange disease. So many die, it pushes the Earth's population towards the brink of collapse. It's an age-old killer that even today can attack without warning. I could not move a finger, I could not eat, I could not drink, I could move my eyeballs and I could blink. Historian Susanna Lipscomb has chosen the apocalyptic calamity of the Black Death as our final top 10 natural disaster. The year is 1348. One of the most extraordinary, and for historians like me, one of the most fascinating episodes of world history is starting to unfold. Word is spreading across medieval Europe that people are dying of a strange pestilence. Having reached the banks of England, it's headed for London, and there's nothing that London's teeming population can do to stop it. Strange black lumps appear on the victim's necks and groins, called buboes. The reason it's called the bubonic plague. Within 10 days of developing the symptoms, over half of those infected die an agonizing death. But the bubonic plague is not a disease consigned to history. As John Tull discovers when he develops strange symptoms while on vacation in New York. We took a cab to the travel doctor's office. I was so sick by that point that I could not sit in a chair in his waiting room. And I laid down on the floor. And he took one look and said, you have the bubonic plague. With his condition rapidly deteriorating, John and his wife Lucinda are rushed into hospital. By this time, I was totally out of it. And uh, they suggested that uh, they put me in a medically induced coma. Lucinda and I talked about it a little bit. We thought it might be one or two, three days. Well, it turned out to be 90 days. Within two days of his going into this coma, his extremities started turning black, his hands and his feet. Today, in the West, the chances of catching the so-called Black Death are slim. But in the 14th century, conditions are primed for the plague to spread like wildfire. The world population had dramatically expanded over the previous centuries. London had gone from a population of 15,000 in the 12th century to 80,000 in the 1300s, all hemmed in between the river and the old Roman wars. London was more densely populated than it had ever been. Perfect conditions for an epidemic to flourish. The squalor is extraordinary. 
With no sewage system, human and animal waste runs down the streets like a river. Yet despite the filth, medieval London's a thriving centre of international commerce, as it is today. This might look quintessentially modern, but trading has been going on in London since medieval times. The city was packed with people. It was a commercial hub. Driven by the demands for silks and spices, international trade flourished. London was overrun with exotic imports and people from around the world. And as well as goods and people, London was being filled with something it didn't want that had been brought to England's shores. The international trade opens the door to a new foreign visitor, Asian black rats who thrive in London's dirty streets. And on the back of these rats are fleas. We now know carry the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis in their stomachs. But in the 14th century, with no understanding of how the Black Death is spread, the people are defenseless to its invisible threat. And so when the disease did arrive, it ripped through this densely packed population and did immense damage. Although uncommon, rats carrying plague-infected fleas are still found in some parts of the US. We live on five acres, and it's in the country. And uh, we have thousands, probably, of rodents just on our five acres. And maybe a third of them have the plague. All it takes is one bite from an infected flea. And John's immune system can do little to stop the plague bacteria from spreading. While John is still in his coma, Lucinda is forced to make a life or death decision. Well, Lucinda woke me up on January 14th or 15th, and she said, uh, honey, I love you. Uh, it's January 15th, and your legs have been amputated. If I had not given permission for that, I don't think John would have lived. And I was determined that I would do everything within my power to see that he would live. So painful, painful, difficult, horrible as it was, I made that decision and gave them permission to do amputations. Although science has done much to combat the plague, as John Tull shows, it can still strike with horrendous effect. In 14th century Europe, all they can do is bury their dead. Excavated plague pits in London give a terrifying indication of just how fast the disease kills when it enters a city's walls. So, Yelena, this is actually the skeleton of a 14th century plague victim. It is, yes. This is a female, and she was found from East Smithfield Catastrophe Cemetery. I'm guessing that she was one of many. Yes, um, from that site, we, we curate over 600, but they believe that there were several thousand uh, that would have actually been buried there. So, yes, high numbers of people dying very quickly. In England, over a quarter of the entire population succumbs to the Black Death. When this huge number of people died, how did they cope with all the corpses? You might think with a catastrophe that you're just going to get these great big open pits and everyone's just going to be flung in rather randomly. But the interesting thing about East Smithfield is that people are actually being placed in a very nice, neat, ordered manner. They're trying to sort of follow the process of a Christian burial, so they're sort of trying to keep some sort of degree of normality around, you know, this sort of awful epicentre of, of this catastrophe. By the time the Black Death finally retreats, it's killed one in three of Europe's population, equivalent to over 240 million today. The death toll, the cost, and the legacy of this disaster have no equal. The Black Death was the most profound disaster that humankind has ever known. Its symptoms were horrifying and degrading. It brought fear and humiliation. It was sudden and lethal. It was the ultimate pandemic and the worst natural disaster that humankind has ever experienced. It's little wonder that we remember it with horror 700 years later. 
The top 10 natural disasters share little in common. They are meteorological, biological, geological. They've struck every continent and caused unimaginable horror. Nowhere and no one is safe. And yet, we are still here. We are the survivors, members of a uniquely adaptable species. Now, we need to heed the warnings of history and prepare for future disasters. Because they will strike again.